If you look at the state of Linux desktops today and compare it to 5, 10, or even 15 years ago, one thing becomes immediately clear. Linux on the desktop is no longer a niche experiment held together by forums, terminal commands, and patience alone. It has grown into a mature, functional, and in many cases, genuinely polished desktop operating system experience. The real question though, is not whether Linux desktops are good anymore, but whether they will finally cross that invisible line into the true mainstream by 2026. To answer that honestly, we need to step back and understand where Linux desktops came from, why they struggled for so long, what has changed recently, and what still stands in the way. Only then can we make a realistic assessment rather than an optimistic fantasy or a cynical dismissal. For decades, Linux on the desktop suffered from a reputation problem more than a capability problem. Early Linux desktops were powerful, flexible, and open, but they demanded time, knowledge, and a willingness to troubleshoot. Installing hardware drivers often meant digging through documentation, running commands, or recompiling kernels. Software availability lagged far behind Windows, and when applications did exist, they often felt rough or inconsistent. Desktop environments lacked a unified design vision, with countless window managers, themes, and toolkits creating confusion rather than clarity. For enthusiasts, this freedom was exciting. For regular users, it was overwhelming. Meanwhile, Windows and Mac OS offered a simple promise. Install it, turn it on, and get work done. Linux desktops couldn't reliably keep that promise. Yet beneath the surface, Linux never stopped evolving. Package managers became more reliable. Hardware support improved dramatically as manufacturers slowly began contributing drivers or at least providing better compatibility. Desktop environments like GNOME, KDE, Plasma, and later Cinnamon. Pantheon, and others matured into polished and coherent systems rather than experimental interfaces. Installation processes became graphical, simple, and often faster than Windows installations. Still, even as Linux desktops improved, most people had little reason to switch. Windows came pre-installed on nearly every PC, schools taught Windows, offices ran Windows software, and network effects kept everyone locked in. Linux desktops were good, but invisible. Fast forward to the early 2020s, and the context started to shift in a way Linux advocates hadn't really experienced before. Microsoft's move toward Windows as a service, with frequent updates, forced reboots, telem and increasing system requirements, changed user sentiment. Windows Onzi, in particular, drew a line in the sand with TPM requirements and hardware limitations that instantly rendered millions of perfectly functional PCs unsupported. Suddenly, users who never cared about operating systems were forced to think about alternatives. At the same time, macOS continued to tighten control over hardware and software, pushing users deeper into Apple's ecosystem and raising costs. In this climate, Linux desktops started appearing not just as a hobbyist choice, but as a practical refuge. One of the biggest turning points for Linux desktops was usability parity. By this, we don't mean that Linux became identical to Windows or macOS, but that it reached a level where everyday tasks no longer felt like compromises. Browsing the web, watching videos, editing documents, managing files, and even light creative work became smooth and intuitive experiences. Distributions like Ubuntu, Linux, Mint, Zorinus, Poppy, Underscore OS, and Fedora Workstation focused heavily on user experience. Linux Mint, for example, deliberately targeted Windows refugees by offering a familiar desktop layout, stable updates, and minimal surprises. Zorin OS went even further, marketing itself directly as a Windows and Mac OS replacement. Pop underscore OS optimized for modern laptops and developers, while Fedora showcased cutting-edge technologies in a relatively polished package. Another crucial factor is gaming, an area that once almost disqualified Linux from mainstream consideration. For years, the lack of native games and DRM support kept gamers away. That changed dramatically once Valve invested in Proton and Steam Play uh, by translating Windows games into Linux-compatible versions with impressive performance. Valve removed one of the biggest barriers overnight. Gamers discovered that thousands of games ran with little to no configuration. The Steam Deck further legitimized Linux as a gaming platform, showing that a Linux-based system could deliver a console-like experience to mainstream audiences. This spilled back into desktop Linux adoption as gamers realized they could keep their libraries and ditch Windows. Professional software has also shifted in subtle but important ways. While some major proprietary applications still lack native Linux versions, 
the rise of web-based software has weakened that dependence. Many users now spend most of their time in a browser using tools like Google Docs, Microsoft, or Zenzu's Assistente Cinco Online, Figma Notion, Slack, Zoom, and countless SaaS platforms. In this world, the underlying operating system matters far less. Linux runs modern browsers flawlessly, often with better performance on older hardware. For developers, Linux has always been first class. But now, even non-technical users are living in environments where Linux is no longer a disadvantage. Hardware support, long a pain point, has reached a surprisingly good state. Out-of-a-box support for common CPUs, GPUs, Wi-Fi chips, and peripherals is significantly better than it was even five years ago. Companies like Intel and AMD actively support Linux drivers, and AMD's open-source graphics drivers are often praised for stability and performance. While NVIDIA remains a mixed experience, progress has been steady, and Wayland's support continues to improve. Laptop vendors are also experimenting with Linux prints. Companies like Dell, Lenovo, System76, Tuxedo, and others now sell systems designed specifically for Linux. This sends an important signal. Linux is no longer an afterthought in the hardware world. But mainstream adoption isn't just about technology. It's about perception, marketing, and momentum. One of Linux's biggest weaknesses has always been its fragmented messaging. There is no single Linux desktop brand. Instead, there are hundreds of distributions, each with its own philosophy, defaults, and update cycles. For enthusiasts, this diversity is a strength. For average users, it's confusing. When someone hears about Linux, their first question is often which one. Windows doesn't have that problem. Mac OS doesn't either. They offer one clear choice. Until Linux desktops solve this perception issue, mainstream adoption will remain difficult. That said, something interesting is happening. While Linux itself remains fragmented, a small set of beginner-friendly distributions are emerging as de facto entry points. Linux Mint, Ubuntu, and a few others dominate recommendation lists and tutorials. YouTube, Reddit, and tech blogs increasingly frame Linux as a realistic option rather than an experiment. Influencers, developers, and even some businesses openly use Linux desktops and talk about it without the old disclaimers and apologies. This slow cultural shift matters more than most people realize. Education and institutions also play a role. In many regions, schools and universities are experimenting with Linux-based systems to reduce costs and avoid licensing issues. Governments concerned about digital sovereignty and privacy are considering or already deploying Linux desktops and offices. These moves don't grab headlines, but they create ecosystems of trained users who grow up comfortable with Linux. By 2026, the cumulative effect of these policies could be significant, even if adoption numbers don't explode overnight. Another underappreciated factor is privacy. Public awareness of data collection and surveillance has increased dramatically. Windows telemetry, cloud integration, and account requirements are increasingly criticized. Linux desktops offer a clear alternative, full control, no forced accounts, no hidden data collection. Distributions are starting to communicate this advantage more clearly to non-technical users. Privacy alone may not persuade everyone, but combined with performance, cost savings, and freedom, it becomes compelling. Performance is another area where Linux quietly excels. On older hardware, Linux often feels significantly faster than modern Windows versions. As millions of machines become obsolete according to Windows 11 requirements, Linux provides a lifeline. This isn't just about nostalgia or sustainability. It's about real economic value for users in developing regions, students, small businesses, and anyone unwilling to replace hardware prematurely. Linux desktops are increasingly attractive. By 2026, the pool of such users will only grow. Still, we need to be honest about the obstacles. Software compatibility remains the biggest challenge. While web apps have reduced dependence on native software, some industries still rely on specific Windows or Mac OS applications. Adobe's Creative Suite, for example, has no native Linux versions. While alternatives exist, switching workflows is hard, especially for professionals. Wine and compatibility layers help, but they are not perfect solutions. For Linux desktops to truly go mainstream, either more companies must support Linux directly, or compatibility layers must become so seamless that users don't notice the difference. Another issue is support and accountability. When something goes wrong on Windows or macOS, users know who to blame and where to turn. With Linux, responsibility is often diffuse. Is the issue with the distribution, the desktop environment, the kernel, or a third-party driver? 
This complexity can intimidate new users. While community support is strong, it doesn't always match the expectations of mainstream consumers used to official help desks and warranties. Increasingly, companies like System76 and Red Hat are offering paid Linux desktop support. But this is not yet a universal solution. Wayland versus Exalet, Flatpak versus Snap versus traditional packages, and other internal debates also contribute to friction. These transitions are necessary for Linux's future, but they sometimes expose users to rough edges. Mainstream adoption demands stability and consistency, not just innovation. The Linux desktop community must continue balancing progress with reliability if it wants to attract and retain non-technical users. So will Linux desktops finally go mainstream by 2026? The honest answer is that it depends on what we mean by mainstream. If mainstream means becoming the dominant desktop operating system, overtaking Windows and Mac OS, then no, that is extremely unlikely. Network effects, enterprise, inertia, and vendor lock-in are too strong. But if mainstream means widely recognized, commonly recommended, and used by a meaningful percentage of regular users without apology or explanation, then the answer is much more optimistic. By 2026, Linux desktops are likely to occupy a solid and visible segment of the desktop market, especially among developers, gamers, privacy-conscious users, institutions, and people with older hardware. They will no longer be seen as only for geeks, but as one of several normal choices. For many users, switching to Linux will feel less like a risky leap and more like a reasonable decision. That shift in perception, more than raw market share numbers, is what true mainstream status looks like. The final piece of the puzzle is momentum. Linux desktops don't need a single killer feature to break through. They benefit from steady accumulation. Each Windows update controversy, each hardware restriction, each privacy scandal nudges more users to consider alternatives. Each year, Linux desktops get a little easier, a little faster, a little pol By 2026, the combined weight of these improvements may reach a tipping point where Linux desktops are no longer asking for permission to exist in the mainstream. They'll simply be there quietly doing the job and for many users doing it better. In that sense, the real achievement isn't replacing Windows or Mac OS, but surviving long enough, improving consistently enough, and aligning with user frustrations at exactly the right time. Linux desktops may not dominate the world in 2026, but they may finally stop being underestimated. And for a community that has worked quietly for decades, that alone would be a significant victory.